Good evening. The title of the lesson tonight is Things Baptism Will Not Do. It might seem like an unusual type of topic because most of the time when we're discussing baptism, we're talking about what it actually does. But uh, there is an importance behind the message that we're going to be discussing this evening. And there is a correlation to the message that we presented this morning regarding marriage and the lesson that we're going to be discussing this evening about things that baptism will not do. There are those that will try to make baptism more powerful than what God did. God, in His instruction within the New Testament, teaches us about baptism and what it does. And yet there are those that want to make baptism more powerful than even God has made it. We cannot go beyond what the teachings are found within the Bible. And so what are those things that baptism will not do? Number one, baptism will not change your nature. There are those, and, and we had our whole summer series um, discussing uh, Calvinism and some of the points of it. And part of that teaching is that when you are born then you have a depraved and corrupt nature. And the only way to get yourself out of that is for the Holy Spirit to come down upon you and to change that nature. And for some reason, uh, those that have come out of that or even through the years, our brethren have been reading denominational material and they've taken on this type of mindset. And instead of, of putting it such as uh, the, the Calvinist would say, and, and trying to put it there, they will connect again the Holy Spirit coming with baptism and say that the Holy Spirit comes to change your nature in baptism. But the Bible does not teach that principle. We will see that as we move forward. Some believe the Holy Spirit is imparted to you so that your sin nature is changed so that you might obey God. And it is true that baptism does change your relationship with God. It removes your past sins. Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, and it adds you to the church, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. However, it does not change your flesh. And that is the teaching that has been a carryover, and that is even crept into the body of Christ that has come out of denominationalism, and especially the teachings that have come from Reformed theology and from John Calvin. It does not change your flesh. The Bible says the flesh is weak according to Mark chapter 14 and verse 38. And we know that Satan is busy walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. And so temptation is always here. And temptation is always about us. And so we must keep away from sin and try to become as Christ would have us to be according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, there is no temptation taken you but such as common to man. And with every temptation, God will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so we can see that our, our flesh is not changed. Now our sins and our past sins are forgiven. We've been added to the kingdom, added to the body of Christ, and now we have access to the blood of Jesus Christ that forgives our past sins and helps us as we continue to walk in the light and confess those wrongs, 1 John chapter 1, to continually cleanse those wrongs. But the temptations never go away. And so Satan is still there. He still tempts us. And so our nature itself is not changed. And why does the Bible teach us to put on the Christian virtues in 2 Peter chapter 1? Why didn't we just receive it when we obeyed the gospel? And why didn't the Holy Spirit just impart them directly to us when we obey the gospel. Why does the Bible teach us that we have to add to our faith those virtues? And he's talking to those that are already Christians. There's a reason for that. Because there is a part that we must play. That was not done when it was there at baptism in which there are many that would teach that the Holy Spirit came and did something there that provided that. But that is a wrong teaching. And so it's important for us to see this. Why does the Bible command us? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Why didn't He just impart wisdom directly into us and to impart that knowledge directly to us? Well, He didn't do that. The Bible teaches us that we are to study. 
And we are to study the word that has been provided by the Holy Spirit so that we may know the Spirit's teaching and have the Spirit's direction when we study and obey it. Why do we even need preachers to share the word of God? Romans chapter 10, 14 through 17. The Bible teaches us that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save others. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. And so we are taught that we must exercise self-control. Titus chapter 2, verses 2 and 5 and 6. Titus chapter 2 and verse 12. And 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. We are to curb our desires with God's help. 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 through 7. And so we make choices, we make decisions because we are free moral agents. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. And we must choose, and we have that choice, to buffet our bodies, as Paul would use the expression, which means we are to exercise self-control. We are to use discipline and discipline our bodies to keep from sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, Paul had to do so, so that he would not be a castaway. And so it's important to understand that just because an individual has now been baptized, if it was true that that nature was changed, then you would not sin after that. If it was that the Holy Spirit came upon you and took the evil out and took away all of that and changed everything and changed your flesh, you would not sin. You would cease from sin. But the Bible just does not teach that principle, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. So there are some things that baptism will not do. Baptism will not change sin baptism however will wash away past sin acts chapter 22 and verse 16 however it will not make something that was a sin before baptism not a sin after baptism sin is sin first john chapter 3 and verse 4 says whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law for sin is a transgression of the law sin does not change just because now we are a child of God, Satan will continue to pursue us with the same sins that he pursued us with before we became Christians. Baptism will not change sin from that standpoint. If you take an addict, for example, they may have been a, a, a drug addict and now they've obeyed the gospel, they've been baptized, can they continue to live as a drug addict and continue in those sins? Well, the answer, of course, is no, they can't do that. And so they have to change. And so that doesn't excuse further drug use after the person is baptized. If someone was practicing adultery before they were baptized, and then they are still practicing adultery after, if they have not truly repented, you see, that's the point that we're noticing as we move through this lesson. There are some things baptism just will not do. Baptism is not going to change sin. It's not going to make something that was a sin before we're baptized, not a sin after we're baptized. So it doesn't change sin. Baptism does not make adultery no longer adultery. If there are some that believe that, and as I said earlier, as I said this morning, that tonight we would be exposing or especially looking at the Olin Hicks doctrine. Now, Olin Hicks debated several of our brethren years ago. I mean several. One of the best debates that I've read is by Brother Andrew Conley, um, who was missionary to East Africa and Tanzania. And he debated Olin Hicks. Jim Waldron debated Olin Hicks. I believe uh, Roy Deaver debated Olin Hicks. There's several that have debated. But the best that I have read was Andrew Conley and his discussions with Olin Hicks on this idea. And, and Olin Hicks would tell us, that you can be living in adultery and you can be in a sinful relationship, but if you're baptized, baptism sanctifies an adulterous marriage. That you can continue in that if you've been baptized. But the things that we look at tonight, as we notice things that baptism will not do, will answer that false belief. And so baptism will not change sin. Baptism doesn't make adultery no longer adultery. Baptism will not change a sinful activity into an accepted, God-approved activity. Thirdly, baptism will not take the place of repentance. Now, we preach baptism very frequently. Every lesson, we mention it because it is significant, it is important, it is at the point in which our sins are washed away, calling upon the name of the Lord, Acts 22 and verse 16. It's important, it's significant. But baptism does not 
take the, repla- the place of repentance. It cannot replace it. And in some places, there are those that will emphasize baptism, 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 and they don't teach repentance. And now you've got individuals that have not changed whatsoever and they're just baptized. I'll give you an example. That happens often in East Africa. And as I was over there, I came in contact with some missionaries, even among our brethren, who were going over and just trying to get people to the water. And even if they were living in polygamous relationships, they would get them to the water. Instead of teaching them to repent and to come out of that, they would get them to that water. Well, maybe later they would teach them the other You see, baptism will not take the place of repentance. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, what did he tell them to do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. What for? For the remission of sin. So baptism is not going to replace repentance. It can't take place of it. Repentance is significant. Repentance is important. We must be willing to change our lives. Sometimes I I struggle with some of the songs that come out, and one of those is the new rendition of Just As I Am. And the new teaching is just come to Jesus just as you are. And it's not come to Jesus just as you are and change your life. That is, if you are in sin, you are welcome to come, but you need to come in repentance and change your life. It's come as you are and stay as you are, and God will accept you. That is not biblical. It's not biblical. And so, baptism will not take the place of repentance. Acts chapter 26 and verse 20, it says, But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. There has to be a change. That takes place in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Truly, godly sorrow will lead you to change your life and repent and turn to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we mentioned this morning, verses 9 through 11, speaks of those in Corinth. They were living in all these different sins. He says, but you changed. They hadn't continued in those. He says, that's where you were. And such were some of you. Notice verse 11. That was past tense. That's what you were doing in that time when you walked as the Gentiles would walk. As Paul would also reference to the church at Ephesus. This is how you lived in the past. But now, you're washed, justified, sanctified. They had turned away from that life. They had turned away from the fornication and from the adultery. And that is very significant. It is very important indeed. And so a drunkard must change. He may not continue as a drunkard and get to heaven. And so baptism does not make getting drunk all of a sudden not a sin. If you make the parallel, that's the argument that's being made. If there's a couple that's living in adultery, then they're baptized. They get to keep on living together even though they're living in an adulterous relationship because baptism changes it. All of a sudden, it makes this activity not a sin, and that's what they're saying about baptism, and so they can continue in that sin. No different if we say, well, we got a drunk over here. And then if he's baptized, he can continue in that condition, and that is no longer a sin. Well, we would never say that, but that's what people are saying regarding marriage and adultery. So that's a big problem. A homosexual must change. If he or she, that individual, may be forgiven of past sins. It was listed right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There were those in Corinth that were a part of that type of activity. He lists them. And both sides of that coin are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. And so when you come there, you can see those individuals can be forgiven of past sins, but in order to get to heaven, they've got to stop committing fornication with the same sex. They've got to repent. So baptism does not make his or her homosexual relationship acceptable. But that's the idea. With this false doctrine of Olin Hicks, is if they're living in this sexual sin, then they can be baptized and they can continue in the same relationship. What about homosexuals? If that is true, then, then you have those that are together in a homosexual relationship, then they can be baptized and continue in that relationship. Oh, we know that's not right. 
You know, when we, when we take the idea that he has placed and confused a lot of people, we take that idea and we place it with other sins, we say, well, no, no that, that won't work. An adulterer must change. That person may be forgiven of past sins, but in order to get to heaven, he or she must stop committing fornication with that partner that God has not authorized them to have. They have to come out of that relationship. Baptism does not make his or her adulterous relationship acceptable, and he or she cannot keep that physical adulterous relationship after baptism and remain in a right relationship with God. They must repent. They must discontinue that practice. And we see in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Adultery does not require two married couples. It only requires one couple that has a marriage. So it's important to understand these facts. And just as a homosexual who marries must divorce their marriage partner and repent for fornication, so must an adulterer who is married against God's will divorce their marriage partner in order to repent and come out of the sin. You say, well, how can that be? Well, it's because they've entered into what would be called a legal marriage, but it is not God approved. You see, when you read in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, and you're reading through that text, he references that individual that marries again. He calls it marriage. But it's a sinful marriage because he calls it adultery. They continue in adultery. And so they have married again. He's considering it a marriage, but it's a sinful marriage. And so they have to come back out of that. Even though the laws of the land may recognize something as marriage, it does not mean that God does. Baptism will not make a sinful marriage right. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, the second union again, is recognized as that marriage, but a sinful one, an adulterous one. So exiting it or divorcing is simply getting out of a sinful marriage or relationship that was started against God's will in the first place. That is called repentance. Baptism does not wash away marriage. And so when you read in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Baptism will not make sinful adultery an accepted marriage. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32 says this, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. And Mark, in his account, in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 2, the Pharisees came to him and asked him, saying, Is it lawful for man to put away his wife? Tempting him. Verse 3, He answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? In verse 4, And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. Verse 5, And Jesus answered and said to them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. Verse 6, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Verse 7, For this call shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Verse 8, And the twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain but one flesh. Verse 9, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Verse 10, And in the house his disciples asked him again of this matter, the same matter. Verse 11, And he said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another, committeth adultery against her verse 12 and if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another she committeth adultery then you go to luke's account in luke chapter 16 and verse 18 it says whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another another committeth adultery and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery and so it is very important for us to understand these principles. Baptism will not make sinful adultery an accepted marriage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul also deals with the same teaching that Jesus gave in those accounts and repeats it over again. But as we come down in verse 10, he says to the married, I command, yet not I but the Lord. Yet, he says, let not the wife depart from her husband, but in, if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away 
his wife. Again, there's that principle of what happens even when you can't physically make a person stay, as verse 15 would indicate. There's no way. Even if your spouse says, I'm not staying and you can't make me stay, and they walk out the door, you cannot physically make them stay. That would be abuse. That would be sin. So you can't do that. And what if they just barge out and they leave? You can't make them stay, even though you want them to stay. What does he say? If she depart, she's got to remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. What about the husband whose wife just left, walked out? Not And let not the husband divorce, that is, put away his wife. That's the passage. And there's nowhere in that passage in 1 Corinthians 7 that will contradict that, will contradict Jesus' teachings. It is all in harmony. And so we come down and see also baptism will not make a homosexual relationship an accepted one. We know that. It's very clear. So if you've got two women or two men, does baptism uh, make a legal gay marriage accepted? Well, we know that. It, there's no way. Even if you had two individuals that, was, that were in a state, it was legal for them to marry. They have legally married, and then they come in, and they want to obey the gospel. And somebody baptizes them. Are they able to stay in that relationship? Well, the answer is no, because part of the gospel plan of salvation is repent and be baptized. They haven't repented. And baptism is not all of a sudden going to allow them to stay in that sexual sin. Baptism will not make a polygamous relationship accepted. Now, Olin Hicks says, look, as long as they're baptized, they can be in adultery. But if they're baptized, then that takes care of it. It sanctifies the adulterous relationship. Now it's no longer adultery. They get to stay in that relationship because before they were non-Christians, but now they've learned, and so they can stay right where they are and continue. Really? You see, what happens is when people take erroneous false doctrines, especially regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and they haven't considered all the implications of that, it's very dangerous. But when you actually take an argument, you take a doctrine that people are teaching and preaching people, and you examine all the implications of it, they have nowhere to turn when you actually put it out on paper. Here is one of the... There's nowhere to go when you put that situation, which they have said, just a couple who didn't know any better, and now they're in this situation, they're married to each other, they obey the gospel, they're baptized, and they're saying now that baptism makes it right, they get to continue in an adulterous relationship. Even the people who teach that doctrine will admit that before baptism they were living in adultery. But now they say they get to continue in it, and it's not adultery. What about polygamy? What about the individual who has married four wives? You know, in, uh, in places like East Africa, a Muslim can have four wives, legally. Four wives and, and, and be just fine. So if this individual and his wives are baptized, and they've been taught, are, does he get to keep all four wives? Because that's the principle. If baptism will make adultery go away for one spouse, why wouldn't it for two or for three or for four? How can you separate that and say, well, it won't work for two or three or four. It'll only work for one. And then if you get into that situation, will baptism make polygamy no longer polygamy? We know better. We know that's not right. Would baptism wash away this adultery? We know it would not. If not, then how is that person going to repent? You see, they would say, no. They, they're going to be able to stay in that relationship. And, and, and I've had people argue with me that we're in that relationship and in, in living in adultery. Say, God wouldn't want us to divorce. Divorce is a sin, and we're in this relationship, therefore we're not going to divorce. And it would be a sin for us to get out of this relationship. What about a person in polygamy? Legally. And they need to obey the gospel. Do they need to divorce the wives? The answer is yes. Otherwise, they, are they going to be able to continue with all four? The answer is no. So at what point? And then what is he going to be able to do? Is he going to be able to pick and choose which wife he wants? I mean, does he get to pick the youngest one, the best looking one, the richest one? He gets to get to pick which one? How's that work? If he's got four. You see, they get themselves in trouble when they get into these arguments. Baptism will not make an adulterous relationship an accepted one. And I want to point this out as we draw our lesson to a close. You see, here is an example that 
will forever defeat Olin Hicks's doctrine. Though I'm telling you, if you're not aware of it, there are so, so many of our brethren that are caught up in this false belief. And I'm positive it's right here in this area. Positive. Adultery. So here you've got a married couple. And you like my stick figures? You've got, you got a married couple here. Legally married. Both in their first marriage. And they've been joined together by God. That couple is a legitimate couple. And yet, the, the, the lady that's in this marriage, this is her best friend. Her name is Mistress. Best friend. And all of a sudden, then there starts an affair between husband over here and Mistress, the, the other lady's best friend. And, and she doesn't know it. She's oblivious to it, but there's an affair. And they're involved in that situation. And then all of a sudden, they get together for a Bible study. You see, because the other woman, she doesn't know what's going on. It's just her best friend and her husband. They won't study the Bible. So they sit down, they study the Bible with them, and they baptize them. Now, you have to understand, adultery doesn't require two different couples. You've got one couple involved in this scenario. That's all it takes to be adultery. So how you have adultery going on right here with this couple and this mistress. And yet they sit down and they, they won't obey the gospel, so they're baptized. The Olin Hicks doctrine would have to say that this man, if baptism sanctifies and removes adultery and makes everything right, if baptism will take away adultery and make something that was adultery before not adultery after baptism, then the Olin Hicks doctrine would have to say that this man gets to keep his wife and his mistress because adultery has been removed. There's no way in the world anybody would ever say that. That's okay. I mean, we all understand that. We can all see that and that's not going to work. Some people are trying to make baptism more powerful and do more things than what God has taught that it does. Baptism will not replace repentance. Baptism is not going to take away temptation. Not all of a sudden going to make us not have sin in our lives and Satan come against us. It's not going to change sin to make something that was a sin before we were baptized not a sin after we're baptized. It's not going to do that. Sin is sin. It's not going to take the place of repentance. It's not going to make a sinful, adulterous marriage all of a sudden an accepted, holy marriage in the sight of God. Baptism just won't do it. Baptism won't make a homosexual relationship or homosexual marriage, for that matter, a right marriage. It won't do it. Baptism won't make a polygamous relationship or polygamous marriage a right marriage. It won't do it. And so these are things that we have to consider. As I stated, this is a direct correlation with what we studied this morning because of the connection to marriage and adultery and divorce. There are certain things that baptism will not do but what baptism can do, if you will come to Christ believing that He is Savior, confessing with your lips that He is the Son of God, ready to repent and turn away from your sins, Acts 17 and verse 30, if you're willing to do that, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 says, repent and be baptized. If you're willing to do that, then your sins can be washed away. Are you willing to do that? Baptism is a wonderful thing. A blessing from God. It didn't come from the mind of men. It came from God. And if we're willing to surrender to it, it can bless us in our lives. If you've not been faithful and you found yourself needing to ask for forgiveness of sins, you can come forward now as together we stand.